Good morning. It's great to be with you this second Sunday in Lent. God has gathered us together in this place to worship him. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? With you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered here this day to call, hear God's word, to call upon him in prayer and praise, and even receive the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first consider our unworthiness and confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition. Together as his people, let us take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, seeking his grace for the sake of Christ and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all of your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For 
for this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise. Let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. And also with you. We pray. O oh God, you see that of ourselves we have no strength. By your mighty power, defend us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. The Old Testament reading appointed for this second Sunday in Lent comes from the prophet Jeremiah, the 26th chapter. There will also be allusions to this reading in the sermon later today. When Jeremiah had finished speaking all that the Lord had commanded him to speak to all the people, then the priests and the prophets and all the people laid hold of him, saying, You shall die. Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house shall be like Shiloh, and this city shall be desolate without inhabitant? And all the people gathered around Jeremiah in the house of the Lord. When the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord, and they took their seat in the entry of the new gate of the house of the Lord. Then the priests and the prophets said to the officials and to all the people, This man deserves the sentence of death, because he has prophesied against this city, as you have heard with your own ears. Then Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and this city all the words that you have heard. Now therefore mend your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God, and the Lord will relent of the disaster that he has pronounced against you. But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as seems good and right to you. Only know for certain that if you do put me to death, you will bring innocent blood upon yourselves and upon this city and its inhabitants. For in truth, the Lord sent me to speak to you all these words in your ears. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Sacrifices, 
have filled my heart with greater joy than when their grain and new wine abound. I will lie down and sleep in peace, for you alone, O Lord, make me dwell in safety. Our epistle reading comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians, the third and fourth chapters. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction, their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject all things to himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand. Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 13th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to Jesus, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated.
right, boys and girls, this was a total fake out. It's actually Mrs. Bernhardt doing the message today, so here she is. <laughs> Paying way too much attention to Bible study downstairs. <clears throat> Good morning, boys and girls. So sorry I didn't get up here on time. <laughs> so last week, Mrs. Rowland talked to you about who was the greatest. And we said, when we look to the cross, we know that the greatest is Jesus, who serves us and helps us, and that we should serve and help others. Today, we're going to look to the cross for something else. I have brought with me some pencils, and I want you to notice something about them. And when you notice something about those pencils, give me a thumbs up, okay? So I'm just going to show them here. Oh, you're noticing some things. So maybe you notice that they are different colors. Did you notice that? Did you notice that some are short and some are tall and some are fat and some are skinny? And this one's even plastic. Yeah, you could tell that from there. So these are all things that you might notice are different. Now, I want you to look very closely. And I want you to notice something that maybe you see is the same with these pencils. Look very closely. If you notice something that's the same, give me a thumbs up. Thumbs up if you notice something that's the same. Maybe you notice that all of the erasers are gone. All of the erasers are gone. They are. Pencils without erasers. Um, nope. Oh, well, there, no, the eraser's gone on that one. It's just white, but if you notice, the, pen, the eraser's used up. What you might know about Mrs. Bernhardt and my pencils are, I make mistakes, like not getting up here on time from Bible study this morning. So, um, I'll tell you, I'll tell you in a sec. So, all of these pencils, the erasers are gone, because when I make a mistake when I'm writing, I turn my pencil over and I erase that mistake. Today, I want to talk about how these pencils are kind of like us people. We're all different. Some of us are tall, some of us are short, some of us are skinny, some of us are bigger. We're different colors, um, but we're all the same in that we all make mistakes and we all sin. And that's where we're going to look to the cross. When we look to the cross, we know that Jesus died on the cross to forgive our sins. And he forgives our sins over and over and over again. Every time we sin and we ask him to forgive us, he forgives us again and again and again. He forgives our sins. So Peter, one of Jesus' friends, said, hey, Jesus, how many times should I forgive my friend? How about seven times? Jesus said, no, Peter, not seven times, but 70 times seven. That's 490 times. Jesus wasn't telling Peter to keep track of how many times he forgives his friends and at 491 say no more forgiveness. What Jesus was saying is God forgives you again and again and again. And guess what? He wants us to keep forgiving our friends again and again and again and not stopping. You see, when Jesus forgives our sins, his erasers aren't like the ones on my pencils. His eraser never runs out, and he will always forgive our sins because of what he did on the cross. Will you fold your hands and pray with me? <clears throat> Dear Jesus, you are my Savior. Thank you for taking away my sin. Help me forgive others. In your name we pray. Amen. You may get a handout and return to those who love you.
Grace, mercy, and peace be yours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Today we see one of the most poignant scenes in all of Scripture play out before our eyes. Jesus is approached by some Pharisees who let him in on Herod's plans to kill him. Of course, this is nothing that Jesus doesn't already know, but at least it's out in the open now. And then Jesus utters what some scholars have called his lament over Jerusalem. The city where God had chosen to dwell with his very presence in the holy temple, those people had just never quite accepted the invitation to be gathered together as the holy people of God. And so Jesus cries out with these words, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Jesus is lamenting over the unwillingness of the very people of God in their obstinance and in their stubbornness to heed his word to gather. And it got me thinking, how in the past had these Israelites shown themselves to be unwilling? What called forth this lament from Jesus? And further, I thought, how might we continue today as God's people to show our own selves to be unwilling? First, I think we show ourselves to be unwilling when we reject the invitation to be gathered in the presence of our Lord. How often would I have gathered you, Jesus says, but you were unwilling. How had God's people Israel shown themselves to be unwilling to be gathered? A couple of things came to mind as I thought through the story of the Old Testament. One thing I thought about was that time when young King Josiah had just ascended to the throne and one of the priests finds the book of the law in the temple. Now back then you have to understand there was not the luxury of the printing press that could mass produce copies of God's word. Last I checked, the average American home had something like more than four Bibles on the shelf, but that wouldn't have been the case back then. There probably would have been one copy of the book of the law residing in the temple. So them finding this book, that would sort of be like the equivalent of Pastor Roland and I rummaging around in some back closet here in the church and stumbling upon the church's only copy of an old dusty Bible that hadn't been opened in years. I think it's safe to say that this moment in Israel's history is a grave indictment on their worship life. I don't very much get the impression that regular worship or hearing of God's word was much of a priority at all. And then there's another thing I think about. I think about the time Josiah celebrates the Passover, and the writer of Chronicles lets us know that no Passover had been celebrated since the days of the prophet Samuel. I don't have the Bible timeline memorized. I know you think I do, but I don't. So I, I cheated, and I looked on a chart, and I thought, how long ago was Samuel to Josiah? And I realized it was 300 years That yearly feast God had commanded to be celebrated every year as the people gathered together, it had been neglected for now centuries. Considering these and other like events, I can understand why Jesus would consider his people to be unwilling. But what about the church today? Well, last year, church membership in America, you might have seen the headline, it fell below 50% for the first time ever. They began keeping track back in 1937, the first year they measured, 70% of Americans claimed that they were affiliated with some church. And remarkably, for the next six decades, all the way until 1999, that was the same, 70%. But now, in just the past two decades, it's dropped considerably, again, below 50% for the first time, and that steep decline is forecasted to continue and maybe even accelerate. Now, to us who are gathered here today, it's hardly any secret that American Christianity is on the decline, but what about those who claim to be a part of a church? How is it going for them? Are they willing to be gathered? Not so much, it seems. According to a 2022 Gallup survey, which measured frequency of worship attendance, fully 66% of American Christians said they attend church less than or equal to once a month. That might not seem too terrible until you drill down into the data a little bit. Of those, one in four said they only attend seldom, 
which usually is code for Christmas and Easter. And fully one-third of American Christians admit they just plain don't go to church anymore at all. So that means that 55%, well over half of Christians in our nation, attend church maybe a couple of times a year or never. They very much show themselves unwilling to be gathered. Now you might be thinking to yourself, Pastor, why are you telling us this? After all, we're here today. We've shown ourselves willing to be gathered. And you'd be right. And I want you to know, as your pastor, I'm so thankful each and every week for your presence here. The only reason I would mention something like this in a crowd such as is gathered here today is that of those 33% who are never around anymore, what you have to realize is many of them used to sit in the same pews you're sitting in. And so I, I simply mention this in the presence of those who do show themselves willing to be gathered so that perhaps, perhaps our Lord might not need one day repent over your own absence. So we show ourselves willing, unwilling when we reject the invitation of our Lord to be gathered in his presence. And secondly, we show ourselves unwilling when we reject the message he intends to speak to us while we are gathered. Consider the Old Testament reading today from the prophet Jeremiah. He brings a message from God to the people, but it's not the kind of news they want to hear. And so they choose to ignore it. Why have you prophesied, saying our city will become desolate, they demand? And Jeremiah is not the only prophet, it seems, whose message was rejected over the years. And this episode with Jeremiah's preaching not being received got me thinking, what are those things today in the church that cause us, the people of God, to reject God's message to us at times? And there were two things that came to mind the first of which was sometimes we reject God's message for the message of worldly ideologies. And usually, not always, but usually these ideologies are concerned with, and I'm going to give you two words that start with P here, usually worldly ideologies compete with God's message when it comes to how we should understand power or possessions. And second, Christians sometimes reject the message of God for worldly moralities. I'm going to give you another P word. Worldly moralities usually have something to do with how we view pleasure. Now, truly, oftentimes, moralities are already a part of whatever ideology one might be holding to, but I broke them apart here to make an illustration. You see, ideologies have something to do with how we think and how we perceive and see the world. Worldly moralities, by contrast, usually have something to do with how we behave. And worldly ideologies usually ask questions like this. Why shouldn't I have fill in the blank? Sometimes it goes like this. Why shouldn't I have what everybody else has? Or there's the flip side of that. Why shouldn't I have more of whatever it is I think I want? These are those whom Paul wrote about in our apostle reading today who have their mind only set on earthly things. By contrast, the ideology of Jesus as we find it in Scripture, the message he proclaims to us would have us ask a different question. Instead, we are to ask ourselves always, what is my Lord asking me to sacrifice, to give away? What might he have me do without for the sake of my neighbor? And when it comes to behavior, worldly moralities often ask this kind of question. Why shouldn't I be happy? Why shouldn't I do what makes me feel important or what makes me feel good? And who is anyone else to judge what I decide to do? Paul also mentioned these kinds of people in today's reading when he spoke about those who find glory even in shameful things. But Christian morality always asks a different question. The message the Bible would have us ask is, is this in accordance with God's will or is it not? And then we let God's word and whatever it says guide our behavior. So the people of God show themselves unwilling when they reject God's invitation to be gathered in his presence, when they reject the message he has for them, and finally, they show themselves to be unwilling sometimes when they reject the very messenger 
the one God has appointed to speak his word and bear his message in their midst. Again, we see in the Old Testament reading, after Jeremiah delivers the news, they plainly say to him, you shall die. And Jeremiah says, do with me what you wish, but no, I'm only doing my job. I'm only delivering the very message God put on my lips and sent me to proclaim to you. The bearers of God's message in Scripture, if you haven't noticed, they always get a raw deal. As Jesus said earlier, some the Lord sent to speak were stoned. Others were killed. Tradition says that Isaiah the prophet was sawn in two from head to foot. And I suppose in the church, there are times when God's messengers today are not liked due to the words they speak. And I could stand up here and grovel to you and relate more than a few colorful stories of times in just a short decade of ministry when I've found myself feeling sorry for myself because people treated me unkindly for something I'd said. And I'd always try to tell myself in those moments, it's not me they don't like, it's God's word. I'm just the messenger. But that didn't always help, and I admit I've had a few pity parties for myself over the years. But at some point I had to remember to put things in perspective. I had to remember the words of the writer of Hebrews who once penned something that's true for me. I have not yet resisted to the point of shedding blood. Any so-called persecution I've faced pales in comparison to many, many faithful men who've gone before me in the office of a prophet. And first and foremost, that includes our Lord Jesus Christ himself. I have to regard Jesus, who shed his blood and gave his life for the message he proclaimed. As he said earlier, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish apart from Jerusalem. They, the people of God, put Jesus to death for the things he said, which, as I remind people often, were nothing but God's truth. He gave his life for a people who continually showed themselves to be unwilling to be gathered, unwilling to hear the message God had sent to them, and even ultimately often rejecting the very prophets God had sent to speak to them. So I have to ask myself, in the face of such a reading, and there are often these kinds of readings in the Lenten season, is there any good news that we can find here on the lips of Jesus? These are tough words. But I think we find a glimmer of hope in this one little word, often. How often I would have gathered you, Jesus says to us. And in that word, I think there is hope, yet, for the stubborn people of God. Because the reality is, God's invitation for us to gather in his presence has not ceased. As long as we have breath, as long as our Lord grants us life and length of days, the offer stands and it's never too late. So he says to us again today, how often I would gather you together as my children. He speaks those words to me and to you. And he asks us, will we continue to be a people who will gather Will we be a people receptive to whatever message he has to bring to us on any given day? And ultimately, will we receive this message from the feeble mouth of whatever man happens to be bearing that message in our midst? The next time this invitation is extended to you and to me, may our Lord and Savior find us, the people of God, his very children, both willing and even attentive to the words he has to speak to us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please stand. Join with me now as we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, 
and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us now pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you see how many still walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Make your mercies known to them, O Lord, that they might repent and become citizens of your heavenly kingdom. Protect we, your people, from their evil intentions and grant that we would follow the example of the apostles who willingly suffered wrong that they might make Jesus known. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Remember the households of this congregation, O Lord. Provide help and companionship to those who live alone. Foster love between husbands and wives, parents and children, that our homes would not be places where we worship our bellies, glory in our shame, or set our mind on mere earthly things, but rather that they would be a refuge here and a foretaste of our heavenly home. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember our nation and those you have placed in authority, O Lord. Give them wisdom and integrity and grant that neither they nor the citizens of our land would hinder your church or despise your call to repentance. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And remember the sick and afflicted and those who mourn, especially Mike and Joe and Jamie, Gary and Jamie, the family and friends of Julie and Jan and Edward, and even those we name now in our hearts. Deliver them for the sake of Christ. Strengthen their faith to hold fast to him who will raise all from the dead on the last day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Remember this household of faith, O Lord, as we gather here together at your day, today in your presence, underneath your wings as a hen gathers her brood. Unite us in the true confession of your word, a sincere repentance for our sins, and a joyful confidence that as we approach your table today, we receive your son's very body and blood given and shed for the forgiveness of our sins. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated.
Please rise. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who overcame the assaults of the devil and gave his life as a ransom for many, that with cleansed hearts we might be prepared to joyfully celebrate this Paschal feast in sincerity and in truth. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and we magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he broke it, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body given for you. In the same manner also, after supper, he took the cup, and when he had blessed it, he gave it to them and said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
And now may this, the true body and blood of your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in both body and in soul to life everlasting. Depart this day in his peace. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that again, you have refreshed us through this great gift. And we ask you in your mercy to strengthen our faith in you and our love towards one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with a great and mighty favor and give you his peace. Please be seated. All right, it's great to be with you again here today. Um, we have some folks here from children representing Children's Hope Chest. This is an organization we used to support in the days before the pandemic came as hopefully we continue to move past that period in our world. It's time once again to look outside the walls of Zion and see how we can support these folks uh, we have a brief video today to show you. Uh, next week, we'll begin sponsorship signups for Children's Hope Chest. So take a look at what this is all about, and then we'll have a representative say a few words to you. excited that we get to pray for you and that you're part of our life. And we're excited that you chose us. We're so excited that you chose us.
Good morning. My name is Martha Glover, and I'd like to reintroduce you to our mission project in Guatemala. If you are a newer member of Zion or have forgotten the details, let me remind you that our support of these two care points works a little differently from other organizations. The quarterly money donations from the churches and from the individual families support the care point by providing food and supplies that are used by all the children. In July 2019, a group from Zion and Faith Lutheran in Oakville spent a visit week visiting the two care points that Children's Hope Chest and AMBI sponsor in Guatemala. We spent a couple days in Verbena, the care point in Guatemala City near the city dump, and then we traveled an hour and a half west of Guatemala City to Tecpan, the care point in rural areas. We were able to witness firsthand the physical changes Zion has helped create. Tables and chairs for eating and crafts, nutritional foods and drinks, and access to better hygiene were just a few of the improvements we saw. We had time to teach a few Bible stories, make crafts, play games, and enjoy just getting to know the children. Several members of the team met our prayer partners. My sponsored child attended the AMBI Care Point in Tech Pond. We met the children in the local village school classroom. The children were waiting for us. And with a picture of my sponsored child in hand, I looked for Marlene. My eyes immediately saw her, and I approached her. I knew that this little girl was mine. After our day with the children, we were given the opportunity to visit homes of two of these families. <clears throat> Marlene's family was one of them. We met her mother and siblings, and we presented them with a basket of appreciation for letting us visit them. Well, looking at the past two years, the lockdowns disrupted any travels to return to Guatemala, but God's work cannot be contained. Children's Hope Chest and AMBI have found ways to continue their work. All the local leaders that we met in 2019 are still active in the program, and they have been kept busy providing food baskets to families and online learning to the kids. Next week, representatives from Children's Help Chest will be here, and I ask you to prayerfully consider supporting this mission, these families and their children, as we work together to bring God's love, peace, and message of salvation to the hurting world. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Martha. We appreciate that. I prayerfully consider that in the week ahead, and please stand as we close our song. Our